Hello and welcome to the Popcorn Junkies. We are reviewing the new Paul Mescal film. Um, he's become a bit of a sort of star, hasn't he? Paul Mescal obviously uh, came to fame or rose to fame in uh, Normal People. Uh, he was also in The Lost Daughter, was it? Um, and yeah, he's you know he's a cracking actor. I really like him. Very understated actor. Anyway, this is called After Sun. This is directed by Charlotte Wells. I believe it's Charlotte Wells' first feature film. Uh, she's a Scottish director. She's made a number of shorts. Um, and it's, it's a basically a two-hander. It's a Paul, a Paul Mescal plays a father, and Frankie Corio uh, plays a remarkable uh, his, his his daughter. She's a remarkable performer, sort of eleven years old, twelve years old thereabouts. Um, and this is kind of a curious film in terms of the structure of it. It's a film that uses, I think, really cleverly digital or digital tape footage. It's not not super eight. Um, it's not modern kind of social media footage. It's parked very firmly where I was at when my eldest girl, Izzy, was 11. And one of the weirdest details of this film is that throughout it, uh, there is the act of opening the old little Sony camcorders and the sound of the eject system as it went and it would open and there'd be the ding. It was so reminiscent, so reminiscent. Anyway. So this is a film essentially about a holiday, a holiday uh, where Paul Mescal, Callum, the father, takes his daughter, Sophie, to Turkey. Um, and it's quite clearly framed, they're very subtly framed, this film, uh, as uh, a process of the footage from this holiday is essentially being watched by a much older Sophie. So in a sense, it's a, an adult Sophie reflecting on a holiday. But the majority of the film is set within the holiday. It's filmed normally within the holiday, and we cut to some of the footage that was shot on this holiday that presumably the older Sophie is watching. Uh, and in a sense, as she watches it back, is piecing together a portrait of her father. Now, I went into this kind of very sort of hesitant, you know, obviously... Um, you know, me and my eldest daughter, um, you know, I, me and her mother separated when she was very young. Um, I, and I knew that going into this, I was going to have an enormous amount of skin in the game when it came to the tensions and the emotional complexities, if you like, of being an absent dad uh, and wanting to make the most of limited time with your child, um, which is a huge issue for absent dads. On the one hand, you want to make your time with them as normal as possible, but on the other, you're kind of also wanting to heighten that experience because you don't have as often with them, as long with them. Um, you're wanting to make memories with them. Uh, you know, the majority of the year you're not with them, you're getting to know them, you're wanting them to have their own life experiences with you, you're wanting them to make memories, make memories. And this is a film about memories. And in a sense, this is as much a portrait of, well, it really is a portrait of the young Sophie and the old Sophie's father. Um, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very slow film. And I don't say that as a criticism. It's a very sort of thoughtful film. Um, there are moments where you're thinking quite literally, my God, how long are they going to hold this shot of, say, Paul Mescal asleep on a bed uh, in their in their accommodation in Turkey or Sophie herself sort of watching other kids playing around the pool? The dynamic between Paul Mescal and Frankie Corio, the young actress, is sensational. You absolutely believe that they're a father and daughter. You believe their relationship. And I like the fact that they didn't go for any obvious choices. So, for example, Paul Mescal's relationship with his daughter's mother isn't necessarily one which is defined by aggravation or conflict or upset. He speaks to her on the phone. He still says he loves her. So there's that sad, there's a sort of poignancy around the fact that he's still obviously invested to some degree in his daughter's mother and, and, and their relationship. It becomes apparent that, you know, Paul Mescal's character is searching for some kind of inner peace. And I thought this was one of the most sort of heartbreaking aspects of this. He often is doing sort of Tai Chi um, in, in the background, you know. So when Sophie's on the phone to her mum, uh, you see him in the background doing his sort of movements. He's, he's looking for some kind of inner peace. He's looking for some kind of meditative settling. And this, I really related to this, because literally, I think around Izzy being the same age and me being, what, 31? Same age as, I mean, this could be a carbon copy. I, I came out and I texted my mum and said, this is, the, this is, it was like a film of mine and Izzy's relationship, but concertinaed into uh, an hour and a half film set on one holiday. Obviously, we had many holidays, but, you know, the, the concept and the emotions and the themes are all the same. And so you've got this sense of him kind of, you know, searching for some kind of inner peace. He's obviously got that strife. He's obviously struggling with something, but it's not obvious struggling. He's not sort of obviously kind of dysfunctional. He's not obviously drinking too much. He hasn't got an obvious kind of uh, defect of character. I mean, he's actually quite an agreeable father. That changes across the arc of their holiday, but you know, he, he's not, he, there aren't any obvious red flags in him as, as a dad. Um, 
Except there's this wonderful moment, which is identical to a moment that I had with Izzy when we were in Barcelona many years ago, where Izzy interviewed me on one of those camcorders. I've got it on tape somewhere. And she interviews her father on camcorder. And the questions get quite targeted and he gets a bit sort of, not antsy, but he doesn't want to answer the question. I think she asks him, what, where did you think you'd be now when you were 11? Because of course she's 11. And he gets awkward about that because obviously he's not where, emotionally he's not where he wants to be or spiritually he's not where perhaps he thought he was going to be. And there's a wonderful shot where they, they sit the camera, the camcorder down on the desk and how those old cameras used to automatically pull focus. Do you remember they focus on one thing, but then they'd lose focus and focus on the other. So you had Paul Mescal's face in the mirror come into focus. Then the television screen would come into focus and you'd see a reflection of Sophie. But then this pile of books next to the television would come into focus. And what was brilliant about that was it was giving you so much, giving you so, so, on so many layers. There were so many layers of sort of information and character information. So you could see his books of kind of almost Buddhist kind of wellness and meditation and seeking, seeking answers. And he broke my, that broke my heart, that detail, because I remember at the same time, I think I was always clutching the Tibetan Book of the Dead in my early 30s or, you know, late 20s, looking for purpose. I was toying with going into retreat. Now, this film moves in a non-dramatic, it's very undramatic. It's very sort of European in that sense. It, you know, there are long scenes where she, she sort of develops a kind of, not friendship, but she hangs out with much older teenagers and you kind of have this feeling that something awful could happen, but it doesn't go down that obvious kind of dramatic route. Instead, she witnesses things. She's drawn to one of the younger boys. She ha perhaps has what you could describe as a, as a sort of holiday romance of sorts. It doesn't go to the sort of awful place. And I, that's what I liked about this film. It didn't show awfulness. It, we didn't have any obvious kind of dramatic peaks and, you know, events happening. It was slow. It was ordinary. Their holiday was kind of ordinary. They did nice things together. They went into the kind of salt flats and they were putting mud all over themselves like you get in the Dead Sea, you know, sort of rubbing that sort of, you know, it's, it's rich in minerals, isn't it? All that sort of mud stuff on themselves. Very naturalistic dialogue between the two of them. And then that interesting detail that crept in that as they were getting towards the end of the holiday, a tightness crept into Paul Mescal's father, you know, as the father. And that tightness I really related to where, you know, at the beginning of a holiday, you've got this, you've got an oasis of opportunities you've got you've got time you've got you've got space you don't have to kind of chase things because you've, you've got you just know you've got time together and of course as you get towards the end you're aware that that time is shortening and so you get that real sense of the sort of you know the, the running out of time the sands of time disappearing and then in a weird way for me the you know the least convincing aspects of this were the extent to which it cut forward in time I think it was almost it wasn't obvious obvious the older daughter the older Sophie looking back on her father but it was almost it was so slight or was so inferred it was so abstract that I you I couldn't relate to the older woman there was a scene where she got out of bed she's I think she's a lesbian and she's got a child and she's getting him she's in bed with her lover and she sits up at one point that, that was almost too clear it was either a case of this should have stayed impressionistic for a, a huge part of the film the only clue we had about the older daughter looking at this footage was a slight reflection in the again the TV screen of watching this digital footage um, and so this this becomes a film about trying to piece together who your parent is. I mean, I wish I had footage of my mum to better understand her. And of course, this film has a tragic sort of sense of an ending insofar as you assume that in the grown-up Sophie's life, in some capacity, perhaps the worst capacity, her father is no longer with her or no longer has a relationship with her or is no longer in her life. Um, and so the film moves towards the inevitability of that. And I was surprised. I was expecting to be a sort of suppurating, sobbing mess, reliving the highs and lows of my relationship with my oldest daughter. And in a weird way, it didn't do that. It wasn't sort of mawkish. It wasn't maudlin. It wasn't sort of full of self-pity and woe is me and all that kind of stuff. It really was a sort of exploration or a trying, a passive kind of attempt to paint a portrait or understand from the limited material and footage that she had who her father was, what was making her father tick. And there's one heartbreaking scene where we see the back of Paul Mescal sat on the edge of the bed and he sobs uncontrollably. And I have to be careful how I talk about this because it was one of the most difficult moments in the film. And the rawness of his own mental health and the rawness of whatever was wrong with him or insufficient in his emotions or whatever he felt was his kind of crack in his character, which he feels he needs all of this kind of Buddhist stuff to kind of almost uh, repair. 
that was that was just heartbreaking. And of course, that's not what she would have seen. And I think this is a clever film about what you see in camcorder footage versus what was going on. And you you get the the biggest sense of Paul Mescal's character when she's asleep in a room. And there was one particular scene that was particularly traumatic. I've talked about it before in my our mental health chats. The event in my younger life when Izzy was you know about sort of I think she must be about nine or ten, and I passed out on the sofa and I'd drunk too much, and you know she was nothing more untoward than that. Happened. But she couldn't. She couldn't wake me up. And my girlfriend arrived, and she said, oh, "I can't wake Dad up." And I drunk too much, and that you know, I forever feel awful about that. And there was a scene not entirely dissimilar to that within this, where he has an argument with his daughter, and um, he drinks too much. He sort of dances too much, and uh, this sort of there was you know a very sad scene where she sees her dad passed out on the bed. So there are moments in this that will really resonate for absent dads. Um, and but there are but as a film, it will really resonate for anyone who has a parent and anyone who has any archival material of their parents in any way, shape, or form, whether it be you know camcorder footage, photographs, or whatever. We are all piecing together, and these bits and bobs, these shards of archival material. I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm obsessed with that. I've got so many tapes of the girls all over the place, and now I've got digital clips on all the phones, and well, we have our vlogs and you know all that sort of stuff. Um, this is an incredibly moving film, but it doesn't overplay the emotion and, or, or pull at the heartstrings. And in a weird way, that makes it all the more powerful when the final sequence or the final shot happens. Wow, it really, really hits you between the eyes. But again, in a very understated fashion, which I think this is very mature. This is an incredibly subtle film. It's an incredibly captivating film, very clever film. Um, and there's one particular dance sequence or, or sequence set within a nightclub where there's this strobe light playing and there's this strobe light flashing and the music's going and we've used this device throughout the film because we've seen the older daughter in this dance and we start to see Paul Mescal in this place like she's hunting for her father in this modern landscape, if you like, of a nightclub. And then we see the young Sophie in the nightclub and it was a really haunting moment which really caught me really caught me because it was so in your face and it was so stylized compared to the very documentarist aspect the natural light the kind of ochres and the kind of browns and the yellows and the sunbakedness if you like of turkey wow very 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 captivating film and a very it might be too slow for some of you it might be too ponderous but sit with it it's not very long it's about it's about an hour and a half but I thought it was a I thought it was a sensational piece of filmmaking, and I thought Paul Mescal was brilliant, and the girl was absolutely sensational. Frankie Corio, absolutely wonderful. What would I give it? I'd give it 95 out of 100. For more film and family fun, don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update.